Good morning, guys. I, uh, I want to jump right in. Uh, we uh, are in this series entitled Good for the Brand, and uh, I got to thinking that for I don't, business people, uh, you know, like my dad in sales and sales management his whole life, or say Guy, for example, uh, managing a church, uh, probably this whole for the brand business and the, is, is silly. It's kind of silly, obvious for you. I, uh, <laughs> I hope I'm using the terms correctly. That would be, uh, that would be embarrassing if I wasn't. But l- let me just start with an example. Let's, for example, you have Coca-Cola, which is a brand of soft drink. And like any other company or any other organization that wants to stay in business, my assumption is that it is important for that company to run every decision they make through a filter of is this or is this not, whatever it is, is it good for the Coke brand? Because, and again, I I know you know this, people are always going to drink, they'll always drink liquids, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a Coke. Hmm? Now again, common sense, I'm, I'm sorry, but... It seems to me that if you have something that you want to share, whether you're going to give it away or sell it, if you have something you want to share with people and your said something is not mandatory, you know, people have a choice, then no matter how high quality your something may be, you have to pay attention to the brand because at the end of the day, perception matters. It just does. Now, I realize that that talk like this within the context of church can border on the offensive. I mean, I could in a sense be belittling God a little more than a product and Christianity is just a brand. And guys, please, um, I mean no offense. I hope I've earned the right to, to stretch you just a little bit. I mean, at the end of the day, God is always, you know, more. He's more than any word. He's always more. He's, he's too big to fit in a box, as we would say. But I, but I am suggesting in this series that I think like this, uh, talk like this, for the brand, this sort of stuff, I think it's worth just a little bit of our time and a little bit of our thought and consideration for a couple of reasons. Here's one. Uh, Loving God, being in a relationship with God, is not mandatory. It's just not, it's, it's not, love is never, it can't be. Love is not mandatory. And you know the way the whole story goes. I mean, God created us to be in a relationship with Him, and then He gave us a choice. And as we said last week, for those who accept God, what He offers, and a lot of this uh, get rich, uh, I don't know, Christianity, this prosperity gospel gets this wrong. What God offers is Himself. He, He is salvation. He is grace. He is identity. He is freedom. What God offers in Himself is freedom, but it is freedom, do you remember, with a purpose. And that purpose, our calling, is to what? It's to present Him. It is to reflect the love that is Him to the world. Go ye therefore. Started all the way back in the book of Exodus and all the way through till now. Go ye therefore. But guys, just as it was true then, the same remains true now. Accepting that love, accepting our presentation, accepting God isn't mandatory. I mean, people still have a choice. So, it seems to me, and this is the way my thoughts have gone with this, given free will on one side and our calling or our purpose to reflect the love of God to the world on the other, given these two things, I think we have to, or at least I think, we have to pay attention to things like branding. I, I don't mean to be harsh, but you just have to ask. Does the manner in which, for example, simplicity, does the manner in which you do church, the decisions that you make, the way you present the church, the activities you engage in, is that good for the brand or is it not? I mean, are our lives personally, in our places of business, in our homes, down at the ballpark with the kids, whatever the case may be, are are we acting in a manner that is good for the brand or no? And yeah, I know, I know that God is God and God is love and there will come a day that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess and and that's going to happen whether I have any integrity or not. But I don't think that excuses us from a little soul searching on this. Forgive the redundancy, but are we living in a manner that's good for the brand? You know, one of my uh, 
favorite sort of glimpses of the early church living with integrity. And that's what this is all about, is integrity. This early church living with integrity comes from the author, an author, a pastor named Bill Hybels. And what he's doing is uh, quoting or remembering uh, something one of his instructors in seminary told him. He, that's what, he wrote this, listen, students, there once was a community of believers who were so totally devoted to God that their life together was charged with the Spirit's power. In that band of Christ followers, believers loved each other with a radical kind of love. They took off their masks and they shared their lives with one another. They laughed and cried and prayed and sang and served together in authentic Christian fellowship. Those who had more shared freely with those who had less until socioeconomic barriers melted away. People related together in ways that bridged gender and racial chasms and actually celebrated cultural differences. And Acts 2, he concludes, tells us that this community of believers, this church, offered unbelievers a vision of life that was so beautiful it took their breath away. It was so bold, so creative, so dynamic that they couldn't resist it. Verse 47 of Acts 2 tells us that because of this, the Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. Now, <laughs> I, that's good. I, I just think that is, that is absolutely good. A amen? I mean, someone uh, can reject the Christian God. They can reject Christianity altogether. But those people, the way they lived life together, left absolutely no doubt as to who it was and what it was that they were rejecting. So, week one, I just wanted you to get your mind around, and I know you did, it's simple, that we have a brand, and that ultimately our brand looks like love. I, I love the way the Apostle Paul, Eugene Peterson, in the Message Translation, puts that familiar text from 1 Corinthians 13. Listen to this, come along with me. So, no matter what I say, what I believe, what I do, no matter, no matter, I am bankrupt without love. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut. It doesn't have a swelled head, doesn't force itself on others, isn't always me first. It doesn't fly off the handle. It doesn't keep score of the sins uh, of others. It doesn't revel when others grovel. It takes pleasure in the flowering of truth. Love, and I'm adding that there, puts up with anything. It trusts God always. It always looks for the best. It never looks back, but keeps going to the end. Love never dies. And guys, a life, and of course we'll mess up. That's what grace is for. Of course we'll mess up. But a life driven by that, a life motivated by that, is good for the brand. Simple enough. Okay, uh, this week I, I want to lead in by, by sharing with you an issue that we've had here in Indiana. And to be honest with you, it, it's an ongoing issue and I hope it stays that way. I hope we continue struggling with it uh, because in my mind the struggle is actually good for making disciples. Now, here's, here we go. In one of our Bible studies, um, women are offered, if they would like, a single small glass of wine. Now, you may not think in simplicity that may not be an issue at all, but trust me, as simplicity gets bigger, you get more people, you have more issues, things like that can be an issue. Now, for this Bible study, for these women, for those leaders, it's not about getting drunk. And it's not about loosening people up. I mean, enough wine, not enough wine is served for that to happen. It's being served as a matter of hospitality and a matter of accessibility. And I want to explain that accessibility thing to you a little bit. Let me give you an example. There's a guy that's been attending church here in Indiana for years. And he started because one day, years ago, his wife had been attending and active, and he just didn't want to have anything to do with it. But we lived on a home over off the main drag here in town, and I'd been out in the yard, and I'd been working all day, and it was hot, and it was summer, and I'm fat, and you know how that goes. And so I'm, I'm sitting on the porch after a hard day's work in the yard, and I'm drinking a beer. Well, this guy drives by, and he sees me sitting out drinking. For some reason, it clicked in his mind that if that's the kind of church that the preacher's willing to sit outside and have a beer after a day's just kind of like I do, then that's the kind of church I'd be willing to go to. Hmm? Now, I, 
I don't know why this is. I, I don't know why this works. I can only guarantee you that it, it, it does. It isn't uncommon for people at all to, to, to think that they can't begin following Jesus Christ exactly as they are. They can't even start following Jesus Christ exactly as they are. And somehow, that beer says they can. Again, I don't know why. It, it just does. So it's, it's accessibility. So on one side, you have a tiny glass of wine. Now, on the flip side of that, there are good people, and I want to be very clear, these are good people who take issue with any, any alcohol being served at a church function. Any sort of church of function, no. And again, I want to be so crystal clear, these people are not being judgmental, they're not, no, they're not self-righteous, it's not, it's not like that at all. They're, and I've sat and talked with them for a long time about this, their concern is genuinely for people who may have addictive tendencies. You know, what they're worried about is that they would see, for example, me. They'll see the preacher have a drink and they'll think, well, if the preacher can do it, then I can do it too. And they can't. And they just, because of their history, they, they, they just can't. And so there's the other side. I mean, for them, alcohol isn't bad in and of itself. That's not the problem, but just not in a church. In, the, in a church, just run too high of a possibility of setting a bad example. Now, Scripture on this, and I hope you're asking, Scripture on this really allows for freedom. I mean, drunkenness, as you'd probably guess, drunkenness is just out of the question. Absolutely no. But as far as having a drink now and then, in Scripture with the Bible, it's not about whether you can or can't. It's more a matter of, of should you. Basically, the Bible allows for personal freedom. It just says, guys, be very careful. Be very careful about not putting a stumbling block in front of people. So, again, I have, I have two opposing views. I mean, and here's the important part. Both of these sides are on solid ground scripturally, and both of these sides are honestly, genuinely motivated by love. What are you going to do? <laughs> What are you going to do? Uh, and so what I did, what any pastor would do, you punt. <laughs> and so, Jamie, pay attention. Whether it's your board or your punt, 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 punt. And here is how this has been handled so far. Rather than creating absolute policies, sort of always yes and always no, our elders, and I'm grateful for them, are allowing us to continue to talk continue to search scripture and continue to ask one another with every single instance, is this good for God? Is this, would this be faithful? Well, what about this instance? And what about this one? What would be faithful now? And just on and on and on. And this is absolutely messy. But again, I honestly think this is how disciples of Jesus Christ in the struggle, in the mess, go, go deep in their faith. But now, here's what's amazing about this to me. And I'll, I'll get to the point. Um, here's why I've shared this with you. Through all of this, and it's been going on for a few weeks now, through all of this, nobody has gotten mad. Nobody has had a tantrum. Nobody has said, you do it my way or I'm going home and I'm not going to go to that church. Nobody's left the church. And if you are familiar with church life at all, you ought to be, I can't see you, but oh, that is absolutely amazing. I think it's beautiful. I want you to listen to me now. Here's the thing. I believe, this is my observation, that we live in a world that absolutely loves to draw lines and divide, right? You are Republican or you're Democrat. You are red or you're blue. You are left or you're right. You are conservative and you're liberal. We love to label one another. That way, see, if I put a label on you, I can decide whether you're stupid and wrong without ever even having to talk to you. I know up front whether you're stupid and wrong just because of your label. And here's the thing, guys. Nine times out of ten, the church is exactly the same way. We are exactly the same way. I mean, from the negative perspective, you've got conservative Christians that are ultimately uneducated fundamentalists who do little more than memorize Scripture and refuse to give grace or even really associate with someone else until they walk like, talk like, act like, and think like another conservative Christian. 
Or on the flip side, again from the negative perspective, you have these liberal Christians who are wishy-washy tree huggers and play lightly with Scripture and refuse to stand for anything because anything goes and nothing ever changes because eh, we're all going to heaven someday anyway, right? You see, we divide ourselves in the church. We divide, and unlike that early church, and I want to be so clear you hear me, unlike that early church who offered unbelievers a vision of life that was so beautiful, so different that it took their breath away, most of the church today, in my opinion, looks like everybody else. It looks just like everybody else. And I don't think I need to say, that's bad for the brand. (laughs) That is really bad for the brand. But this morning I want you to see that in Jesus Christ that's an alternative. I'm just going to read in the Gospel of John, in the 8th chapter, this story, if you've been around church at all, you're familiar with it. It's one of the favorites. It's in, again, John chapter 8, and I'll read the first 11 verses. Let's listen carefully for the Word of God. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, He appeared again in the temple courts where all the people had gathered round Him, and He sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery, They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? And they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and he started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And again he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman standing there. Jesus straightened up and he asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, Now go, go now, and leave your life of sin. Now, I need you to think about this. Yes, I think in a stereotypical, and again I say stereotypical, conservative response, what you tend to get is law without grace. I mean, people are just left condemned. Throw the stone, throw the stone. In a stereotypical liberal response, you get grace without law. Eh, whatever. And, and people are left unchanged. But Jesus gives us this beautiful both-and alternative. He showers her with enough grace to give her hope. But then right there at the end, He gives her just enough law in order that she might change and grow and get better and become. You know, we see liberal and conservative. We see grace and law. We see both. I think in Jesus you get both because why? Why? It seems to me that you could do both because he was not interested. His primary interest was not in being right. His primary motivation was love. The love of the Father and the love of that woman. Listen, and you know this, you know this, you know this. Jesus embodied both grace and law because his motivation was love. Always love. Now, here's why I think I'm supposed to have have brought this this message and, and, and then I'll stop. Um, as you make decisions there at Simplicity, and there are always more decisions to make. I mean, on a personal level, as we make decisions about raising our kids, or decisions about our careers, or our finances, or our relationships, to just basically as we live, sometimes along the way, love demands a firm no. Every parent, every, uh, sometimes love means no. Sometimes it gets to be a yes, and sometimes you are, I certainly am, sometimes we're wrong. We're just wrong. And, uh, I honestly think that struggle is good. I think, and again, that's how we grow. But when, like Christ, our motivation is love. When our motivation is love, we can say yes and we can say no. We can agree and we can actually disagree. We can be graceful and true to the law. When our motivation is love, when the motivation is love, we can actually remain, as we have here, whole as individuals, as, as family, as, as, as a church, whole. 
and unified together one. And I think in a culture that is absolutely riddled with division and labeling and pinholing and cruelty, our unity is good for the brand. <laughs> it's really good for the brand. I love you guys.